Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So what we're going to look at today is a type of 18th century short sword, um, and I'll just grab it here. Um, I have shown this in an unboxing video previously, um, but we're just going to talk a little bit about the context of these and the way that they were used in the 18th century. So uh, you'll often see them described as hunting hangers, and indeed a lot of them are specifically made for that purpose. Um, but they were used in a wider variety of contexts than simply that, um, simply for hunting. And uh, famously so, if we look at um, images of uh, early 18th century um, pirates, for example, we sometimes see them using this type of what was known as a cutto. Now it's almost certain that the word um, cutto is what led to the word cutlass. Um, in fact, we do see early forms of the word cutlass, uh, which comes from essentially a knife. Uh, it's, it's the same root as cutlery, for example, um, and it some, comes from the same uh, root word. And it, we see these types of small um, short sword um, or hanger um, used in the 17th century. So, for example, um, in the middle of the 17th century, there was a particular type of um, short sword of hanger called the uh, the Hounslow, or what we now call the Hounslow Hanger. Um, that's because they were made in Hounslow in West London, in fact, close to where I grew up myself. Um, and they were used, they were issued or, or sold to um, pikemen and people like this. So they were a common sidearm. Now that's the important part here. You've got to remember, I, I mean, I know I bang, about, bang on about this an awful lot, but swords are predominantly sidearms, like knives are, they're big knives. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're looking at main battlefield weapons, with a few exceptions from history, throughout history, predominantly the main weapons are either a pole weapon or a weapon which shoots in some way. So, uh, a, a firearm or a, a bow or a crossbow or something like this. Um, so, but a sword has the advantage of it's not the most awesome hand to hand combat weapon, but of course you can wear it conveniently. Now, you need to remember that. So, in the 18th century, we find uh, that a lot of people were using spadroons, um, my favourite kind of sword, as you all know. This is uh, Napoleonic ones. This is a bit later, but it was the one that I had to hand. So, this is a 1796 um, infantry officer's spadroon, but it's not dissimilar to spadroons that were in use earlier in the 18th century. And in fact, if we go all the way back to the end of the 17th century. So in the age, in the golden age of piracy, for example, um, we do in fact start to see um, rapiers shifting over to what we call transitional rapiers and small swords and weapons like this, uh, known as the spadroon or sometimes the shearing sword, things like this. Um, so essentially they were thrust centric swords with some cutting capacity. And indeed, of course, we get the, at the extreme end of the spectrum, we get the small sword. This is a court sword as it happens, but it has a, it's a small sword bladed court sword. So. The only thing that differentiates those is the more ornate hilt, essentially. Um, and yes, you may notice this is made for a left-hander, not a not a right-hander, um, which is fine. I write with my left hand, so I hold this left-handed. Um, and um, yeah, so small swords and spadroons were very much seen as the the gentleman's sword, and they have, I think overly been uh, classified in some books or described in some books as a, a dress accoutrement and that's sort of that's given as the explanation for why they're so sort of dainty as it were they're smaller than rapiers hence the name small sword they're not as broad as back swords and broadswords or cutlasses um, and it's, therefore they're sometimes seen by some people as like a dress sword <laughs> There's an element of truth to this in that some of them, based on their hilt decoration, are very much um, dress swords. But you'll often find the blades on them are perfectly functional, serviceable, specialised thrusting blades. And, you know, anybody who um, wants to go up with, a, say, a cutlass, for example, or even a, a sabre or a back sword against someone with a, a good person with a small sword, you will find that the small sword can very much hold its own, has some weaknesses, but also has some strengths. And um, it's very easy to penetrate with these. Um, and, you know, running someone through, um, through the body with one of these is going to put them um, out of combat uh, fairly fairly well, fairly quickly if you do it in the right place and don't get hit back at the same time. So these were effective weapons, but 
For various reasons, if we look at the artwork and we read the sources from the 18th century and indeed the late 17th century, so this again this fits in with the golden age of piracy, we do see weapons like this becoming increasingly popular. So why were these so popular? Now I first should say in a straight up fight between a small sword and a hanger, I would generally speaking give the advantage to the small sword um, for a number of reasons. Okay, uh, firstly, it's longer. Uh, never underestimate the advantage of reach. Okay, um, so if you can reach the opponent from a distance at which they can't reach you, and remember, you've always got the ability to move away or move around. Um, so if you can be giving them wounds while they're attacking you and they're trying to come in and hit you and not managing to hit you. Um, then clearly that's good because you're injuring them, they're not injuring you. Secondly, you can defend with this perfectly adequately against this. Um, so for example, we do occasionally fence uh, small sword versus military saber. Our gymnasium sabers, practice sabers that we use, are the real weight, real balance, real size of actual 19th century military sabers. And I'll tell you what, with an epée, you can parry them just fine. So long as you parry down near the base of the blade, so in the first half of the blade, in the fort or strong, um, so long as you parry down there, you can absolutely um, adequately parry all of the cuts from a saber. Obviously, if we went to the extreme, if we went something like a long sword, then you might struggle. But certainly against rapiers and sabers and back swords, you can parry with a small sword perfectly fine. Um, it helps if you've got a good hilt, um, but if you're taking the parries on the blade, the blade can handle it. Um, so absolutely you can defend against the, the cutlass or the cutto or the hunt, hunting hanger perfectly fine with a small sword. So you can parry, you can thrust the person back, you can move out, assuming that you have space to. Now, that's where we come into it. So why? would these weapons have been popular? Well, who were they popular with? Well, we know that they were popular with people like pikemen. Um, we know that they were popular with infantry who were primarily armed with a musket and bayonet. So their primary weapon is obviously the gun. Their secondary weapon is the bayonet, and this is a backup. Um, and we know that they were popular with sailors and pirates. So why might that be? Well, the first obvious thing is because in all of those contexts, whether you're a pirate, a, a, a navy sailor, um, or you're a, a pikeman in the late in the 17th century, or a, a, a musketeer, then with a bayonet uh, from the late 17th century onwards, this is going to be not necessarily even a secondary weapon. It might be a tertiary weapon. Okay, even for the sailor, for the pirate, your primary weapon will probably be a firearm. Um, some type of musket or a carbine or maybe pistols, um, maybe a blunderbuss, something like that. Um, but this is going to be a backup weapon. So what do you want from a backup weapon? You want to be able to wear it comfortably. Well, absolutely, whether you're on board ship or in a melee on land, um, this is a weapon that you could wear. And indeed, if you're hunting, of course, this is a weapon you can wear absolutely comfortably anywhere, anytime. It is really just like a scaled up bowie knife, isn't it? Okay, so you can wear that comfortably at any time. And remember, these weapons would only be used as a last ditch, as a last resort. Um, and also, therefore, within that context, if you're using it as a last resort, you're not generally going to be using it for dueling or necessarily by choice going up against someone who's using a halberd or a, or a bayonet. Uh, you're going to be using it when you're at point blank range. Okay, so if this is a weapon which you're having to access in the heat of the moment, then first of all, you want something that's short and quick to draw. Okay, you want it to, easy to wear. We've already covered that. You want it quick and easy to draw. Brilliant, short, good for that. And you want to be able to use it at point blank range, at, at basically almost at boxing range, don't you? So at this range, you can stab, you can cut, um, you can even, you, you know, you can slice, you can push cut with it at this range. You can stab someone behind you there. You can stab here really close, here really close. You can, uh, you can stab from different angles in really, really close in wrestling. Um, even you could um, turn it around and use the, use the other edge. You might have two edges, but in this case, I've only got one. You could use the back edge in uh, grappling situations, cutting hamstrings, cutting behind the neck, all this kind of thing. This is extremely useful up close. It's more like a big knife. And like I say, it's more like really a big Bowie knife. So um, that is one of the reasons why these were so popular. Easy to wear, easy to draw, 
and easy to use in a close, messed up situation. And yeah, absolutely, officers in the Navy um, did, wear, did wear and use swords like this sometimes, but we also know situations where they had swords like this for wearing and perhaps for dueling if they got into a matter of uh, a question of honour. But we also know that in some situations they switched to weapons like these for uh, boarding parties and for actual, you know, close in combat. Um, now, in terms of, I just want to briefly address in terms of what this does to the opponent. So, thanks to Hollywood and TV, um, the, I would say the effectiveness of cutting is a little bit overstated um, in modern people's minds. So if we just look at modern crime statistics, it is very clear to see that people who are cut have a much better chance of survival than people who are stabbed. Okay, Doctors will tell you the same. Um, and if we look at historical, um, historical doctors' accounts or historical you know, battlefield accounts, then we see the same again. The thrust was more often lethal than the cut. And that's for many reasons. It's for the immediate reason that a cut doesn't enter the body as deeply. You might sever things, you might sever veins, um, but a thrust penetrates through the body. But for a secondary reason that's very important in a historical context, and that is treatability. Now, I've spoken about this before, but in, let's say, the 18th century or 17th century, if you chop into someone's, um, someone's body or limb with one of these, um, then they have numerous different ways of treating that wound. In the most extreme example, they'll just cut the limb off um, and then basically burn it or seal it, prevent it from the person bleeding to death uh, and prevent infection as best they can. But they, there's numerous ways of treating that. A thrust is much, much more difficult. It's not as bad as a gunshot wound because a gunshot wound is like a thrust with great tissue damage and carrying dirt um, residue from the ball and clothing, dirty clothing, into the wound. A sword is cleaner than that, so you're probably more like, well, you are more likely to die from a gunshot wound than a, than a sword or knife stab. But the stab goes through and into the body, and um, the, the medical science of the time in the 17th and 18th century, really up until the 20th century, is not very good at dealing with that. And additionally, we've got the problem of bleeding. So a bleeding wound from a cut is generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, gonna bleed outwards. Um, and you can stop that, you can staunch that loss of blood. The problem with a thrust wound is you're very often gonna get a lot of bleeding internally. And again, that's very, very difficult to treat, very difficult to stem, and the person could bleed to death in a way that you're not able to stop. Okay, so um, absolutely, this, generally speaking, is a, obviously if you cut someone's head off with this and you thrust someone in the foot with this, you, you can tell which one, but, but generally speaking, um, cuts from one of these are going to be less fatal than thrusts from one of these. However, there is another aspect to talk about, and that is stopping power. And as I've talked about in many previous videos, one of the issues with thrusting is yes, you can reach further with it. Yes, in some ways you could argue it's more direct. Yes, it's gonna penetrate clothes more easily. Yes, it's more difficult to treat. All of these things, it has lots of advantages. But a disadvantage is that you can run a point into someone's body and they will continue coming at you. And there are many historical accounts of this happening. One of the advantages of cutting weapons um, is they're percussive at the same time as cutting. So they pass into the target and hit it with a fair amount of surface area of the blade and they push the thing away. Additionally, they traverse an area across uh, in front of your body. So as the thing passes across, it tends to clear things out of the way. So if, for example, someone thrusts a sword at me and I simply thrust a sword at them, there's a very high chance that we just thrust each other. If someone cuts at me and I cut at them, there's a fair chance that our swords will go pling in the middle, okay, and naturally parry each other or stop each other. Um, so cuts by, and this is one of the things George Silver talks about, of course. So cuts by their very nature are in many ways safer, but safer for the attacker and safer for the defender, um, but they're less likely to kill. So there we go. I hope that's covered actually quite a few um, sort of points of why these were such popular weapons and 
There's one final one actually while I think of it. There's another point which we mustn't underestimate and that is most people's natural, or most people I've ever met and certainly most people according to the historical sources, most people's natural inclination when they're absolutely crapping themselves is to hit, okay, is to do this, okay. It's, it's not to do this. So um, if you've got a bunch of sailors, uh, for example if you're arming them with cutlasses, you could train them to stab and they probably will stab more of the time, but their natural inclination will be to do this. So you may as well give them a weapon that's effective when you do this with it. So all of the reasons why these cuttos or hangers were so popular, um, it, almost in an unofficial and non-regulation way in some cases, but why they were so popular in the 18th century. Short, easy to carry, short, easy to access, um, short, easy to fight in a close-in environment, and finally, relatively effective at cutting and stabbing, but also complies and fits with what is the natural inclination of someone who's a tight in press and trying to defend themselves. One final thing before I go. Another thing I've thought of, these were occasionally used as tools. Um, now, they are not optimised for that. Certainly this example is quite light, it's relatively dainty, and I wouldn't want to go chopping up too much with this, um, apart from meat, which is what it's designed to cut. But some cutlasses are quite robust, some hangers are quite robust, and yes, absolutely, you can cut through ropes. You might have to take several swings, but you can cut through ropes, you can cut through wood, you could split firewood with them, you could use them like this, um, like the French, um, just grab one, like the French glaive, okay? Uh, so absolutely, yeah, in some cases they could be using tools, but I don't think that, with the exception of this, uh, I don't think for most hangers and cutlasses that was the primary purpose at all. Um, they've got axes for that, after all. Um, but yes, as a, as a sort of uh, tertiary use of the thing, yes, absolutely it could be that. Anyway, I hope that's been somewhat interesting. Um, and this is a, just to speak specifically about this one for a second, this probably dates to, I think, about 1730, 1740, could be a bit earlier. Um, and it's probably French. Um, hunting hanger, but it absolutely could have been carried in military or civilian uses outside of hunting as a weapon, absolutely, and it would function perfectly well in that capacity. And yes, absolutely, this is the sort of weapon that we sometimes see pirates um, like Blackbeard wielding. Anyway, I hope that's been enjoyable, and I'll see you guys for the next video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. We've got extra videos on Patreon, t-shirts on Spreadshirt, and I hope to see you for the next video.